We are, um, it's our great pleasure to welcome now as our speaker, Professor Stephen Holgate, CBE, who is a world leading expert of respiratory disease. He chairs various expert um, panels and committees relating to the effects of air pollution. He's the co-author of Every Breath We Take. Um, and Stephen is going to speak to us uh, now about the health challenges of outdoor and indoor air pollution, the hidden public health problem of our time, and what needs to be done. So no, not too much there. Thank no, you. No. Stephen, all great, everyone. Thank you very much. What a great privilege it is to be here. Uh, I came to Southampton in 1975 and, uh, when the medical school had only just started. So as a medical practitioner, as a young doctor, uh, riding around on my moped around Southampton, and I can tell you it's, uh, it was different then than it is now. I was born in Manchester uh, in 1947. And of course, during that time, the city, just like Southampton, had been heavily bombed and was subjected to incredible difficulties in rebuilding because of the destruction of the cotton industry that had happened over a number of years previously. But I do remember as a child the incredible pea supers that we used to get, just as uh, happened in 1952, which led to the Clean Air Act of 1956. And the thing about all of that is, and I remember as a child, is you can actually taste it. I mean, not only see it, but you can taste it because there was sulfuric acid uh, in the air, um, which we don't have anymore. Well, of course, the Clean Air Act swept all that away, or so we thought, until uh, the new emerging pollutants uh, are starting now to have big effects on health. And when I uh, came to Southampton, I came ready to study respiratory medicine, and I trained under uh, Jack Howell, who was the founder professor of medicine at the university here, and he had an interest in asthma and respiratory disease. And I spent my career in that um, over the last, what, 40 odd years, and I'm retired now. But the University of Academy have re employed me again. Uh, and I suppose, in a way, being re employed means you can reinvent your career, because I don't believe in retirement. There isn't such a thing as retirement. Retirement means withdrawing. Uh, when you actually don't have to do things for other people, you can do things that you want to do. And so I spent the first 40 odd years of my life researching asthma and related diseases. And we were some of the first to do some of the air pollution studies too, here in Southampton and elsewhere. But that really wasn't leading to anything. And even though I chaired a number of government bodies and all the rest of it, including the Royal Commission on Environmental Pollution, we never really made any progress in policy. And that gentleman's question at the back was absolutely spot on. You can research forever if you want to, but you've got to get people to change their behavior in order to create policy and to generate you know, the right sort of um, environment that will create the change we need. So when I did retire, which was about four or five years ago, I decided that I would use my respiratory clinical career to try and actually do something about this area. And uh, while I was on these government committees, you kind of can't. It's rather difficult to do that. But outside of it, you could. So I went to see the President of the Royal College of Physicians, and I said to him, look, we've got a massive problem here of air pollution in this country. We're a small island. You know, we're very overcrowded. We've got rotten roads. We've got to do something about it. And he actually rose to the challenge and gave me the opportunity of pulling together this uh, working party, which we met over about 13 to 15 months, to produce our report uh, two years ago in 2016, Every Breath We Take. And in a way, that was the first time that people had taken the sort of evidence-based approach and translated it into almost layman's language into clinical effects and then what one might do about those clinical effects. And it was an extremely exciting journey for me personally to be engaged in that. And I'm very grateful for the Royal College for helping me. Well, obviously since then we were able to produce the figures like the 40,000 deaths brought forward and the 20 billion pounds that's talked about in terms of the economic costs and so on. Well, that was the start of a very interesting journey for me because it made me realize that by actually putting our research into a language that people could understand, politicians started to wake up to this. 
And suddenly we started to see uh, interest being generated because previously air pollution fell under DEFRA or the environment in its various forms. And the Department of Health had very little engagement with the whole process. And throughout the time I was chairing all these things and uh, looking at the research, they kept moving the data from the health to the environment. And then the environment would just put it in a case and turn the key and lock it. So nothing happened. And so this report that came out from the Royal College really opened up the case that we now had a very serious problem on our hands, a public health crisis. And it coincided with a number of other things round about that time, like the World Health Organization revising its, revising its uh, guidance, like the Lancet Commission on Pollution, saying that pollution is the number one public health issue in the world now, beyond infectious disease, wars, and everything else. And that, um, finally, uh, evidence from huge studies in the US demonstrating that there was no safe limit of air pollution. It went right away through zero. So all of this really uh, empowered us, I think, to say, look, we can do something. So we started to translate the um, report into practical actions, engaging with ministers and engaging with parliamentarians. And this has led to all sorts of you know, things that we're now witnessing in the public domain. So yesterday I was at Mansion House and uh, City Khan brought together 20 mayors across the country, including Andy Burnham from Manchester, for example, and City there himself, with Michael Gove. And we were sitting in a room, 20 mayors from the biggest cities in this country, all dealing with these problems, who said to him, we're not tolerating this anymore. Now that was a groundbreaking moment. I mean, you, know, you weren't sitting in that room, but you could feel that this was a tipping moment. It really was. A little bit like the plastics when we had the television um, program that brought all that up to the surface, the group of pub, and, and put it onto the agenda. So yesterday, I think we reached a tipping point. And Gove actually was in quite a difficult position because he had the most powerful influences from all the cities of the country sitting around him telling him that together they want this problem solved and saying that Southampton, Birmingham, Liverpool, Manchester go out and sort it out for yourself was not good enough and so what, what happened yesterday is that Gove actually was persuaded and we'll see what happens that he has to go to the Treasury now and get central government support for this whether it's the scrappage schemes, whether it's this, whether it's you know, help, whatever it is. Each city's got its own formula. But I genuinely want to say to you tonight that I felt, you know, the first time I've ever felt this, I really felt that we've passed that tipping point now. And that to go back from that point was impossible. So Siddiq Khan, uh, with all of us, are writing a letter to the Prime Minister which summarizes the events of that meeting yesterday, uh, where all the city, uh, held, uh, all the city mayors uh, came together to insist, insist on a new Clean Air Act when we get into Brexit. I'm not only trying to use the current European guidance that we currently have, but no, to go down to the World Health Organization level. And Gove bought that. He's, he's willing to have a go at this. So this is incredible in terms of you know, recognition and the power of the people influencing the next set of uh, change that will occur over the next 18 months. So you know, I stand here in front of you, uh, frustrated like many of you, that nothing's been done for so long and it's all been passed in the periphery. I think things are going to change now. The final thing I'll say before my one minute is finished is that yesterday, uh, well today actually, but yesterday it started, we announced a new working party that I'm chairing with Jonathan Grigg from Primary University of London on indoor air pollution and children's health, which will involve schools as well as houses. And with, by children we mean conception to 18 years of age, so that's the whole period. 
and we're going to, we're doing an evidence-based, systematic evidence-based review at the moment, then we're getting, uh, we've got a lovely working party we've put together, we're going to have several meetings, and we're going to do another uh, report like we did for the Royal College of Physicians. What's important in that report, apart from the evidence that we're going to gather, is that we've got parents and children who we're also getting evidence from. And the Royal College of Pediatrics and Child Health have got 7,000 families across the country who are going to give evidence to our particular uh, report, to give it a sense of reality and to make sure we're grounded in that reality when we come forward with recommendations. And finally, when I was with Garen Davis yesterday, who is the MP for Swansea, he's written a green paper on the new Clean Air Act. Gove has bought this, so we're going to work with him on that new green paper to turn it into a white paper with Brexit. And we need all of you to come behind some of the basic principles of that green, of that green which will be a white paper, I hope, which is the right of every human being to breathe clean air. That's what that Clean Air, clean air Act is going to be about. And whatever's needed to deliver that, that is what that is going to move forward towards. So the next year or so, I think, is incredibly exciting. What you're all doing is amazingly important. I can't tell you how important it is, but local communities like Southampton demonstrate that they mean business. And the fact that our council here has had the courage and bravery to do what it did the other night is absolutely amazing. And I think we've got to get behind them and help them in any way we can, because the future is not just ours, it's the future of our children as well. So, I mean, somebody asked about what happened if you turned off all the air pollution coming from emissions, but it dropped to zero. I think the map was trying to do that. We get, you know, emissions coming over from Europe, which we can't directly influence, and we get emissions, as you correctly pointed out, from agriculture and other sources, um, secondary particles generated through ammonia and sulfate uh, from agricultural practice. But those aren't the really problematic um, chemicals that are causing the pollution problems. The one Matt talked about are the important ones. Industry. Industry is coming behind this. There was a view, and it started off in Newcastle actually, but there was a view saying that if you cleaned up the air, you would destroy jobs, you remove industry, and people would pack up and move out. That was the argument. And that probably was the argument the presented other night. Yeah, the other night in the, in the council, I'm sure it was. It's the argument that was presented in Manchester, in Liverpool, in all the places of other same But in fact, that isn't the argument. Because if you look at the health economics of all of this, and look at the indirect as well as the direct costs of air pollution on health, and the 20 billion, incidentally, a year, are only the direct health costs, the hospital and the you know, general practice. The indirect costs of all the time lost from school and work and all those other things that, that happen. It's something like 65 to 70 billion a year if you put the indirect costs into that. Then the long term benefits will be enormous, absolutely enormous. And in fact, uh, Imperial College did a beautiful study, well worth looking at, which was published about a month ago, where they looked, predict, looked at predictions where if you reduce the particle by one microgram, uh, per uh, meter cubed, what, how many deaths you would save, how many asthma attacks you would reduce, and how many whatever. And they did it for Lambeth, which is in kind of one of the nasty polluted areas of London, versus the Lake District, and showed you the differences between the two. And the, and the health gains were huge, just as they were with passive smoking when we stopped there. And I'm quite certain that if we actually did this, we're going to get unexpected health gains that if you look at the indirect uh, benefits that that would have on society, would greatly outweigh any of these uh, arguments we have about uh, immediate short-term costs. Um, of course, you know, one has to be sensitive to this. Industry will have short-term costs, but one thing I would say, and it was said yesterday repeatedly by the mayors, look, if Britain wants to do this. It has to be a leader. It mustn't be a follower. New industries are going to come out of this. New ways of doing things. I only have to walk around this city now to see what a wonderful place it is. A fantastic place to be now. Whereas 1975 it was a dump. And that's because people have had the courage to actually move forward 
uh, with change. I was a special advisor on the House of Lords Select Committee of Science and Technology Report on Complementary and Alternative Medicine. Um, and in that report we did actually come out very strongly in favour of certain aspects of complementary medicine. But it has to be evidence-based. And the arguments in that report were not about randomised controlled trials, which is the way we classically look at medicines. But what alternative ways can we capture the uh, full uh, impact of complementary medicine on human health? Because often it's combinations of different therapies that people use. The Alexander technique is a particularly good example because it's been shown to be greatly beneficial in multiple sclerosis and Parkinson's disease and even in patients with dementia. So, yeah, absolutely. But this is not to do with pollution. Breathing exercises helps breathing, and we have a paper that was published in The Lancet recently, um, not me doing it, Michael Thomas in Southampton read it, showing how breathing exercises can help asthmatics. And he did a beautiful trial, and it was very widely quoted, and um, just demonstrates that here in Southampton, they actually are researching that and taking it very seriously. Because it's a matter of uh, uh, acquiring ownership of the problem. And it's the lack of ownership of the problem, passing it around different departments, transport, health, environment, whatever, which has led to the fact we've got no legislation and no controls over this. So exactly right, joined up with us and ownership. And I will stand in front of you saying that my profession has been one of the worst uh, in this whole area. The medical profession has not taken ownership of this area. It took ownership of passive smoking and was able to, you know, get legislation through very effectively, but not of this area. So, you know, I'm kind of trying to get the medical people saying, the general practitioners, the respiratory specialists, the cardiovascular people, in their hospitals, in their general practices, to, you know, really start bringing this up the agenda, asking questions of patients, and lobbying their local MPs and their local councils to try and improve and all the other things that will improve health in the long term. Over the next 12 months, we're going to concentrate on that because that's the bit I think we haven't really done well enough, to be frank. Including Michael Gove, of course. I mean, I, I think Birmingham, I think, were the first ones yesterday, or they, or they were to actually introduce a clean air zone. I think they've actually are the first to do that outside of London. Southampton, obviously, are, are going out to consultation now on this, following the vote the other night. So we'll have to see what people say. Uh, there was discussion yesterday about alternatives to clean zone, but, zones, but what Michael Gove said, uh, the Secretary of State, was clean, uh, clean air zones are the standard that we will assess all other uh, potential uh, interventions. They've got to be at least as good as. So that is quite an interesting argument. I mean, you know, when it comes down to it at the end of the day, we just have too many vehicles on the roads. We just have too many, I mean, and that's got to alter. Better public transport, better active travel, better mobility for people through other means. And therefore, um, trying to concentrate all the effort on just reducing emissions is not necessarily going to be the long-term answer. The long-term answer is going to be not electric cars everywhere, but better public transport and better communication and urban city design, which will be uh, what I hope will be the outcome of the long-term plans in the future. Client Earth, who put the three cases uh, um, of the uh, UK government to the, through the courts, is, uh, was highly successful. And they're, do, and they're going to do it again, by the way. There'll be a fourth one in uh, Also, you probably notice in the European Commission have taken the UK government are going to take the UK government to court. Um, or not to court, they have taken them to court, and they're going to impose fines on the UK government unless they clean their air up much more rapidly than they're currently doing. So that is all happening now, and it will continue to happen. So that's coming out from this end. We've got to squeeze from this other end, really, which is to get public support, members of parliament, and legislation in this country to change rapidly and in a way that's going to is to create the tangible changes that we're all looking for and not have this bumbling passing on the bus from one government to another. Um, and, uh, you know, maybe this time next year I can stand here and say that maybe some of that's happened. 
I sense, just as with plastics, I sense we've reached that tipping point. I really do. I'm not just saying that, you know, I wouldn't say it otherwise, but I do. So I think the will is there in government. Sally Davis, our Chief Medical Officer, re uh, annual report this year was on pollution, uh, Health of the Nation report. So, you know, it's, it's all these people are talking about it now in government. So we've just got to keep pushing. And the more places like this do to make their noise heard, the more likely it is that we're going to get the changes happening soon.